And so this morning, we're going to be presenting together. Um, as we were coming close to Women's Weekend this year, because of all the craziness that's going on with the pandemic and everything else, we were trying to figure out what is something creative or um, different, unique that we could do. And as I was going through, we've been going through the book of First Peter, as you all know, and you can start turning there, First Peter. Uh, we're going to be going to chapter 3. As we were going through it, and we saw that had we just kept going, that on Women's Weekend, we would have landed in a passage that Peter is addressing women. And so we said, well, this might be God's providence. But it wasn't a, a topic that I was going to tackle on my own. So I asked Lady Key if she would join me up here and help me with presenting this passage this morning. And um, she finally agreed and consented, maybe with a little bit of kicking and screaming, but not much. Um, but I'm we, grateful for once that the room is empty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So this morning, I ask that you join us uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3. Uh, we're going to read for the sake of context, verses 1 through 7. But um, the sermon this morning, our presentation this morning, lesson this morning is going to be coming from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And next Sunday, we'll, we'll deal with um, verse 7. But for the sake of context, we're going to read verse 7. And also, uh, we're going to be reading this morning from the NIV 84 translation. So this is the old NIV translation, not these new ones that, that kind of messed up. Um, but we're going to be reading from that translation this morning. And it'll be on your screen so you can follow along with us in that translation. So, y'all listen, Lady Key is a little nervous, rightfully so. That means the Holy Spirit is going to come in and work real good. And so I need y'all to pray for her and pray for me. And pray for our time together as we look into God's word. So Amen. before we begin reading, let us bow our heads and let us pray together. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this time, this sacred time, this appointed time, this time that you knew before we did. And so, Father God, we pray for your help, your grace, your anointing, your power to walk into this opportunity that you have orchestrated. And we, we praise you and we are grateful that you would decide to use us on this morning to open up the pages of the scripture to help your people, help us hear from your word. Would you allow your word to give life to us? It led it to encourage our women and our ladies and bless them and celebrate them. But God, would you also let it to encourage the whole body of Christ and not just as this pastor talks about wives, but women who are not married as well. God, I pray for your anointing on those yes. of us who are listening, all of us who are listening to your word this morning. Anoint our ears and our eyes and our hearts that we will receive from your word on this morning. And God, would you anoint Lady Key and I? Would you settle her nerves and allow her to be used by you? Would you settle my nerves and allow me to be used by you? God, we do this because we want you to get the glory. And we want your people, us, to be edified. And so we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. So 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse number 1 from the New International Version, the NIV 84 version, it reads like this. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Verse 7 says, husbands in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers. The word of the Lord is blessed. So we're titling our message talk this morning from this text. What, Lady Key? Inside Out. 
beauty mm. that's homegrown. All right. All right. Here yeah. we go. Let's get it. Let's get it. <clears throat> I want to show y'all what my son, I'm not going to tell you which one, but I'm sure you can guess after I show it to you. My son showed up to his Zoom class wearing. Y'all remember what we call this? It's politically incorrect, but. We will not call it that. <laughs> but he showed up on his call wearing this. But you know what? When he showed up and felt a little embarrassed, the next day, he woke up earlier, he washed his face, he brushed his teeth. Not that he didn't do that the day before, but he brushed his teeth. He put his hair cream in his hair, he put his aquaphor on. You know, we lather our children in aquaphor. <laughs> he chose a color coordinating outfit just to join that Zoom call. And we all have had to learn the proper and presentable way to show up to some of our own Zoom calls that we've had to join too. This has been a very unique and precarious season with the coronavirus pandemic. We've been quarantined, teleworking, extended tax deadlines, not being able to gather together locally as a church, justice social uprisings. Social justice uprisings. <laughs> Thank you, right. social justice uprisings. We've had to be really creative with a lot. Yes, even I mean, this even this morning. I mean, just, I mean, I consider myself to be creative, but this has been a bit much. From learning how to homeschool, celebrating birthdays, Mother's Days, Father's Days, even Women's Day, like you said. So Zoom calls, we've had a lot of them. Virtual this, virtual that. If you weren't already wearing yoga pants and pajamas, guess what? You're wearing them today, and you're probably wearing them to work, but you just change up, put on a little button up or blouse. <sighs> but um, ladies, I know you've also been putting on that makeup, too, preparing for that 9 a.m., Call. I'm not going to get on you too hard because, I, like I told you, I just got on one of my sons for putting on all of his uh, stuff for his Zoom call, too. And I'm actually kind of surprised that I remember how to get dressed for church today. But, you know, things have been rapidly changing in, the, in what, mat, what seemed like a matter of just a couple of weeks. Everything has been canceled. Birthday parties were canceled. Weddings have been canceled. Vacations, even funerals. I mean, everything's been canceled. I'm grateful Women's Weekend wasn't canceled. You saw our theme, Women's Weekend 2020 is not canceled. Y'all caught on to that? But women and women's events have always been the pinnacle and anchor and influence in our society, especially in church, especially in church. And for the past couple of weeks, Pastor Perrin has been preaching to us through the book of 1 Peter. And by God's providence, as he said, we landed on Chapter 3, verses 1 through 6 this morning on Women's Sunday, talking about wives submitting to their husband. And Pastor <laughs> couldn't think of a better wife to teach on this text than me, his own wife, his homegrown beauty. And yes, <laughs> you are my homegrown beauty. And I'm grateful and amazed at how God orchestrated things for us to land on this passage this morning and, and that you even agreed <laughs> to do this with me this morning. Thank you. Prayer works. Um, it's amazing how God <laughs> in our life, though, will connect the dots. I remember my Amen. dad's old sermon, how connecting the dots, and he connects the dots in, our, dots in our lives that they come together and make sense in a way that we could never have tried to make sense of it on our own. Because the truth is, is that this probably isn't the best Women's Day passage to speak from. Just like last week was a problematic passage, so too this week, this, this text, this passage can be a little bit problematic as well. Um, but I do believe that as a result of us studying through this passage this week, we were able to see how this passage can actually bless and be an encouragement, not just to wives, but even to just women in general, even to women who are not married as well. And I believe that us men can get something out of this text as well. Um, and so I, I am grateful that we're able to see how this text can be a blessing and encouragement to women as well. Yes, you're right. Because, ladies, I know how off-putting this passage can be at first glance. I mean, when you read it, it says, starts off with wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. That word submissive, it sticks out like a sore thumb, like the first commandment, like it's commanding us to be submissive. Y'all know that word makes us cringe. And 
But don't tune me out just yet. Don't tune me out just yet. Because even though this passage is talking about wives being submissive to their husbands, if we dig a little deeper and you give me a chance to illuminate exactly why Peter is saying what he's saying, we can see that Peter is not just talking out of the side of his neck. He's trying to show us a different way of how we can be presentable, not just what's on the outside, but what's on the inside as well. And while we're still inside during this pandemic, we do have an opportunity to work on some things on the inside before we step out outside. We have this unique opportunity, although a forced opportunity, we do have a unique opportunity to work on what is really appealing, something that is homegrown. We're, we're at home, yep. pandemic, homegrown, something from the inside out. And these days, it seems like we have just transferred our focus. Before, we were spending time preparing and being presentable for church, being presentable for work, uh, school, social activities, sports activities. Now we've just transferred that presence, that presentation to Zoom calls and quarantine cooking parties and social distance birthday parties, drive by to say hi. By the way, thank you all for driving by to say hi last week. Yes. We really enjoyed that. Yes, thank you. Um, but, but what's your Zoom call with Jesus looking like? I mean, how, how are you making sure that you are presentable for that? There are some things that we do need to, to apply more focus to. We do apply a lot of attention to what's on the outside. I mean, you know, I, I did get yes. print, <laughs> print, <laughs> print for this time. But I, I, too, also need to apply a lot of attention and more attention. I do apply attention to what's on the inside, but we need to apply more attention to what's on the inside. But you know... You got to help me out with something. You do have to help me out with something. Now, we could either, like how we see being at home, either being safe at home or stuck at home. We, we've been at home for 18 Sundays. I counted myself, 18 Sundays so far. So it's about your perspective. So we, you got to help me out with this word submission. Like, why, 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 would, he, why would Peter even... Why, why would he even, why? <laughs> well, I, Lady Kino, that's a really tall <laughs> order. Um, and I'm sure Peter's wife probably has something to say about this too when she read this because I don't know if y'all know, but Peter was married yep. as well. Um, there's a couple of occasions in scripture that we know that he was married, but one is that in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it talks about how Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. So we know Peter was married. So I'm wondering what his wife said to him after she saw what he wrote. Um, but here's one thing that I feel like we have to keep in mind, um, and it's something that I've been trying to reiterate each week as we've been going through this book of the Bible. Um, we have to keep in mind that Peter is writing, as I've been saying, to shepherd scattered sheep. This means that believers in his day that he was writing to, they're in this hostile and very precarious situation, to use your word, Lady Key. Literally during this time, Christianity is still in its early stages. It's still forming as a church. And it's, it's growing in a way that's uncommon because it's not even an official religion yet. So it's almost like an underground religion is being sprouted um, out of the ground. Mm -hmm. And at this point, people are kind of skeptical of this new faith, this new religion. So when Peter begins to address wives who are believers of this new faith, he's trying to, um, particularly wives who are believers to, to men who are not believers, um, and, and their wives, um, their husbands are not obeying God's word. He's trying to instruct them on how do they now relate to their husbands within the context of their new identity in Christ. Mm. One commentator said this that I found to be very, very helpful. He points out how during the time that Peter was writing this letter, Christian women within the church, they enjoyed substantially higher status within the church in the Christian subculture community than unbelieving women in outside of the culture, um, the church culture. And although Christianity did not seek to change the status of women outside in the broader culture, they did change the status of women within the church community itself. And this actually allowed Christianity to flourish among certain groups because it led to change outside of the Christian community as a result of 
what was happening inside the Christian community because so many women within the Christian community were serving in places of leadership in the church, and they were very influential and played an important role in the church. And so women outside of the church was like, I want to be a part of that. And that was a way for them to be able to witness to, um, to other unbelieving women. Yeah, look very attractive. So, yes. So Peter wasn't using this passage to put women in their place. But really he was trying to instruct wives on how are they to relate to their husbands now that it is clear that because they have this new identity in Christ, <laughs> that they are equal with men. That they are equal with men in God's eyes. And even in a society at that time did not see women as equal. They knew that within the church and in God's eyes with our new identity in Christ Jesus, that women were equal with men. In fact, one of the ways that we can be certain that Peter isn't trying to use this to put women in their place and just suggest that women were not equal with men is because in verse number seven, it tells us, and it, Peter is emphasizing here, that wives are co-heirs with husbands of eternal life, which lets us know that men and women are equal in God's eyes. And this isn't just an idea that originated with Peter because we see from the opening pages and writings of scripture where it says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says that God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Both male and female, he created him. This is telling us and instructing us that God created both men and women to reflect the full image and imago day of God. They are co-equal in God's eyes, and they both reflect his full image. And so Paul even goes further on to explain this in Galatians chapter 3, where he says that now that those of us who have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so when we come to this passage in 1 Peter, we know that Peter, is in, as he's instructing wives to submit to their husbands, he's doing so not to put them in their place, but he's doing so, so that as they submit to their husbands, it would reflect to the broader culture how powerful this faith in Jesus Christ was. Mm. By submitting to her husband, even an unbelieving husband, she would have the chance to demonstrate to the culture and of her, her way of surrendering to God and her hope in God. She would be showing and giving a presentation to the world and a demonstration to the world that her submission was not just to her husband, but really it was unlike the world and it's not just to her husband, but it's really ultimately a surrendering to God. And it's, it's as a result of her relationship with God. And just by the way, another thing we need to keep in mind is that Peter knew how important women were. Okay. After all, he got the good news that Jesus Christ had been resurrected from the dead from women. That's right. The first proclaimers of the gospel were women. Mary mm -hmm. Magdalene, Mary Mother of James, and Salome. They were the first ones to proclaim that Jesus had resurrected and risen from the dead. And Peter knew how important of a role women have been playing in the early church. They have been playing such a vital, important role to the growth of the early church. Like who? Say their name. Say their name. Say their name. In <laughs> Acts chapter 9, verse 36, it tells us about Tabitha, or another translation says Dorcas. And it is said that she, is a, that she was a disciple who was full of good works and acts of charity. Obviously, she was contributing to the local church. Um, in Acts chapter 16, it talks about Lydia, who is said to have been a worshiper of God and who used her money literally to fund early Christian missionary movements. Romans chapter 16 is just gives us a list of significant women who played a role in Paul's ministry. Phoebe was said to be a deacon, a servant, who had been a patron of, of many and even of Paul. In verse 13, we see the couple Priscilla and Aquila. Um, it was a husband and wife team, but Priscilla is mentioned first which would have been unusual in that day, but mm -hmm. it lets us know that she perhaps was doing more of the teaching and more of the discipling than even her husband, Aquila. Then verse 6, it talks about Mary, who worked hard in the local church. And then verse 7 talks about Junia, and it says that she was an outstanding woman among the apostles who were also in Christ before Paul became an apostle. So she was an outstanding apostle amongst the apostles. That's what they're talking about, about Junia. So all of this means that when men try to use the concept of submission in the scriptures to control and be domineering over women, that is not God's intent. We can 
infer from this passage, in fact, that submission of wives is not absolute. Mm. If a husband's requirement of their wife trying to um, get their wife to obey them, if it, if it meant that the wife had to disobey moral laws or follow another religion or disobey the God, something God has set out in his word, she would be able to disobey and not submit to her husband in that area because she had to submit to God as her governing authority, as her authority over her life. Amen. So ultimately submission is not about control and it is not about domineering our wives. It's about literally leadership and protection. The reason I submit, you all, some of you all know that Lady Kim and I, we have a pastor and first lady, Pastor John Jenkins and First Lady Trina Jenkins. Yes. And we have, we have submitted ourselves to their leadership as our pastors. And the reason why we do that is because Pastor Jenkins and First Lady Trina, they cover us. They protect us. So that if we go through, and there's been some times we've gone through some hardships, and they have provided and protected us and covered us and given us counsel. And so in doing so, we are really submitting to God as we submit to Pastor Jenkins and First Lady Trini. At any drop of a hat, they can tell us to stop doing X, Y, and Z or to start doing A, B, C. And we will submit to them because we know that as we submit to them, we are actually surrendering to God as they are the covering and the protection and the leadership over our lives. So in this passage, as wives are instructed to submit, it really shows their trust in God. They trust that God controls the outcomes and that we all can trust God with the outcomes if we surrender fully to him. So submission should not be boiled down to just obedience. And many people try to think that that's what submission means. No, submission is really about leadership. It is about um, responsibility. It's about covering. It is about protection. So submission is a key ingredient to relationship with God in a covenant relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Especially in a in a marriage or a covenant relationship when you're talking about uh, a, 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 a covenant, a, yes, a, a lifelong like, commitment unto yes. God. I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, in a covering, like oh, you yes, yes. mentioned, we have a covering pastor. Mm -hmm. So, ladies, submission is for us. It's it's not it's not for our husband. It's not so that the husband can can tell you what to do. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you all heard of like forgiveness? It, it, it's it's for yourself. It's for you. It's not for the other person. It sets yourself. Free yes. It you sets forgive. yourself free. I would liken it. I would liken submission to forgiveness. So um, it's about setting yourself free. Peter says, wives, in the, sa in the same way, in verse 1, in the same way. What same way? What same way is he talking about? In the same way that Christ suffered for you so that you might, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. These words, these words, Peter is giving life to us. He is talking about. Us living. Live. How yes. yes, God's word is living. God's word gives life. God's um, it, it's it's talking about in the same way. That's what we have to do in order to live. And when we do submit to our husbands, the real focus is on Christ and not actually our husbands. And that's the real pathway mm -hmm. to freedom yes. is yes. through submission. Yes. And if I could just throw this in here, by the way. Um, if there are any unmarried women out there who are contemplating marriage, I would encourage you to make sure that the man that you're marrying is submitted to somebody else. Mm. Because you need to be able to go to somebody that that man is submitted to in case he starts acting a fool and say, my husband is acting a fool. I need you to be able to talk to him and he will listen when you talk to him. And so you need to be in a relationship, if you're considering marriage, you need to be in a relationship with someone who will be submitted to someone else. Right. And so what I've learned by studying this passage is, is that wives, we can actually get our husbands to obey. <laughs> Let me give you all a secret. To obey the word without us having to say a word. We can win them over without a word. You know how we say, I can show you better than I can tell you? 
Well, how about we use that as a good threat? Let our actions speak louder than our words. Let them see the work that the word is doing in us and on us so that we don't have to say, see, don't you see Christ working in me? Don't you don't you see him working in me? Let the word work in you so you don't even have to say any of that. So I'm gonna get back to our children. You got something to say? Nope. OK, I'm going to get back to our children. Um, we have pretty four aggressive sons. And um, when I say boys will be boys, they they are boys. And uh, they keep us constantly praying without ceasing. And um, we not only pray for them, but we pray with them that they would use their aggression for good. Now, we want them to be active, but we want them to use that, that activity. That activity should point toward God. So that act, they should be active for God's sake, not just, not just randomly be active, but use that activity to point towards God. So in verse 2, um, when they when when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, without saying a word, they will see just how beautiful God's word is through us. Submission is about demonstration, demonstrating that homegrown beauty that's on the inside. That's what real submission is about. I think that that's homegrown so beauty. How you pointed out that this passage is saying that an unbelieving husband, a husband that does not obey the word, without you saying a word and you just showing them what the word has done in you, mm. that you can win them over. Yeah. That is so powerful. And that through submission, it is a demonstration of homegrown beauty. Whew, you're talking good up here, lady. Yeah. Kate. Um, and so I think that application for that, not just for uh, married women, but also for unmarried women and also for us brothers as well. An application for that is for us all to remember how important our conduct is. Our conduct is important because through our conduct, we are able to show the world how good God's word is. We're able to show the unbelieving world and other people what happens when we obey God's word? What happens when we allow God's word to work in and through and on us? People can see that. I'll get it. I'll get it. Oh, okay. So we have a little illustration that we want to, that we want to show you. So some of uh, we, you have seen. Yeah, this mug that we actually um, got on a trip to South Africa. And what happens when we put, hopefully you can see this on the screen, when we put hot water into this mug. And hopefully the water is still hot. It's hot enough. <laughs> is that as you put the hot water in the mug, hopefully you will see that it begins to change on the outside. Is it changing? Not yes, yet. slowly no. but surely. Yes. Um, I want to point you all to chapter 2, verse 12 that says this. That we are should live such good lives among the pagans, among the unbelievers, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. And so what it is saying, helping us to try to understand is that we need to let God's word work on us. And that if our good conduct, if we allow God's word to work on, our, on us, our good conduct should dis display on the outside. It should be a demonstration on the outside. Yes, and we always want God to fill us up until we overflow. <laughs> but one, what are we filling ourselves with so that two, when it does overflow, it'll overflow with what God has put in us and not with what we've put in the cup ourselves. Um, you know, they say what comes out of an orange when you squeeze an orange is what's ever inside the orange. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a lemon. But yes, or it, it works with an orange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> orange juice, lemonade, hey. But that's why it's so important to work on what we put um, on the inside so that inside out. Yeah, we can work inside out. Yeah, work inside out. So verses 3 and 4, we're going to keep moving. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as braided hair, and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. I feel like Peter is attacking me right now. He's giving you life. Yeah, giving me life. Instead, 
It should be that of your inner beauty, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Here, Peter is not telling me that I can't get my hair braided or that I shouldn't wear any jewelry at all. But I'm sure he didn't want his wife out in public looking a mess either. But um, what, he <laughs> but what he is saying is that there is no need to overspend to spend an exorbitant amount on these things that will fade away. You know, quality clothing is good, and you can get it on clearance, but all of these things will perish. In Proverbs 31, verse 30, it says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. That's what we should be focusing on. Again, remember, we've been quarantined in the house for 18 Sundays now. And Peter is trying to spare us from all these outward adornments that we probably can't even wear anyway. You know, we, we quarantine 15, you gain that, either gain that quarantine 15 or you transition to wearing your pajamas and shorts every day. So instead of spending all of this time and money on outward adornment and accessorizing our outward self, we should spend more of our time and energy working on our insides. And when we do do that work, of becoming more gentle and having a quiet spirit is how we make ourselves more presentable for our Zoom call with the Lord. And that's what pleases him. Mm -hmm. And in 1 Samuel 16 and 7, the Lord, it says, the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And, you know, I think that this is a really good point because, um, we put this in our notes, but you took it out. But you know how people say black don't crack? <laughs> and that's true. Black don't crack, crack. But guess what? Black does droop. <laughs> it does sag. It does expand. And so we can't just, ex um, just focus on the outward stuff because all of that stuff is fading. And listen, the passage says that instead we should focus on the inner self, the unfading beauty, the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That stuff don't fade. Mm. Inward stuff, that stuff does not get old. It doesn't fade. It, it, it lasts. It does last. When you read that, you said something. Well, the Bible, which is living, said something. It said, instead. Mm -hmm. Instead. That is an active word. Mm -hmm. Something that you have to do. A gentle and quiet spirit is one. It's, it's not one of passivity. It's one of activity. Say that again. So Peter say is again. No, say ah! that again. a gentle and quiet spirit <laughs> is not one of passivity. Yeah. It's one of activity. That's so good. So I hope y'all write that down. That's, uh, a gentle and quiet spirit. That's not trying to say be passive. Right. When he's saying instead, he's actually saying be active. It's not about being passive. It's about being active. Yes. Yes. So Peter is not implying that by not saying a word that we should just brush it off and shut down like most of us tend to do by saying, oh, well, I'm just not going to say anything at all. No, activity is required, which is why Peter says to win them over by our behavior. You have to do something. We have to do something. Working on our outside just won't do. We've got to work on the inside. So there, again, there's activity involved. Adorning involves action. So what's the action you're wondering? When your husband is chilling on the couch with his feet up because he's tired. I'm tired. You're tired. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been homeschooling, teleworking, Zoom calling, quarantine cooking, cleaning, Instacarting, Swiffering all, all day, but you tired, right? But then we have others who've been at home by themselves, and then the one day they want to go out and visit their relatives, somebody got something to say. You know, you're going to wear your mask. You, it, everybody's got something to say about your choices. However, but before you get ready to go off, and snap and right? Clap and clap back. Right. <laughs> Wait a minute. Just just wait a minute. Before you go off, you have to center yourself. Again, what do we say? It's not about passivity. That's right. 
It's about activity. So you, you can't just pause, though. That's right. You got to put something in that pause. That's right. So in that moment, yes, pausing is good. Not going off is good, but we have to replace it with something. Yeah, it, pausing in that pause, you got to adorn. Yes, and not we got to. Don't do anything. Right. We have to adorn, put on something, adorn yourself with something. And this is my suggestion. You've got to say, God, I trust you or God, take control. Say something in that moment, something active. Be active in that moment or reciting a scripture that you've meditated. But again, we're talking about working on the inside, right? If you haven't meditated on a scripture in your pause, you what are you going to put in your pause? You have nothing to recall. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to, it's important to use your quarantine times mm -hmm. to fill it up with preparing for your Zoom call with the Lord. That's right. That's right. Uh, yo, I like this one. Go ahead. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise <clears throat> I like accessories. But otherwise, we'll be accessorizing with the wrong things. And I just want to make sure myself that I, oh, sorry, okay. I'm accessorizing with the right things so that I, too, am prepared um, by meditating on a scripture so that I'm ready for my pause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, just, just know that earlier when I said that submission is our demonstration of a homegrown beauty, here Peter is also emphasizing that action is a, our demonstration of homegrown beauty. Yeah, so not only is submission a demonstration of homegrown beauty, but action as well. And I think that that's the key. It's that in those moments, if we don't have something to put on in those moments, a lot of times we fill that gap with stuff. We yeah. fill that gap with the things that we've been accessorizing our life with, which oftentimes are um, not tr um, things that are not true. They are intuitions. They are things that we have been surmising in our head. And we have to, in those moments, be able to put something in those moments because truth is you, that moment won't stay empty. You're either going to go out of control and snap and clap back or you can submit yourself to God and surrendering that activity to God and saying, God, in this moment, I'm going to trust you. Instead of me trusting in what I would normally do, instead of me putting this thing in my hands and doing what I would like to do, God, I'm going to trust you with the outcome. And I'm going to trust that if I surrender myself to you, that you will change the situation better than I can in my own hands. Yes, and using this moment to adorn, but adorning can also be transforming your mind that's yeah, right. and renewing your mind. And I think that that's why the passage first, um, excuse me, Psalm 119 verse 11, it says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That idea of hidden in my heart is literally that idea from the scripture here. It's, it's that hidden inward self where the word has, you've been meditating on this word, you've been um, eating this word, getting it into your system so that when that moment comes, you're able to recall it back to memory really quickly. Because otherwise, we're going to fill it with other stuff. And that's why on Wednesday night, I encourage people. I say, you need to be at least uh, reading at least one chapter a day of Scripture. You need to be consuming something every day to get God's word in your heart so that you be able to recall it to memory when you need it. When you need it, you need to be able to recall it to memory. Right. And when you hear that, though, it seems like, oh, here they go again. Mm -hmm. But when you actually start practicing it, and it starts becoming your life and you start living it and it becomes so natural to you, it becomes second nature and you won't dread it <laughs> so much. And that's what I remember about my grandmother. She was so drenched in the word um, that it was just so natural. Her responses were the word, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they were just so so natural. Um, when I would call her, I remember calling her, um, whether it was when I was in college or newly married and I had, whether I had a problem or not, her response was always with the word, whether she ended her calls with love one another. Like I didn't, I didn't call with a problem, but she'd always end it with like love one another. Remember to love one another. And that's God's, yeah. God's greatest commandment. So like I, if, if we, if we, 
don't remember to to do those things as he's has he's urged us to as Peter has urged us to do um, for in this way. Verse five for in this way. Ah, sorry, for this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful. Yeah. That's what my grandmother did. She used God's word and her hope in God's word to make her beautiful, make her beautiful. And there, there's nothing like being able to have something to depend on that is beyond your husband. Right. So when we talked about submission in the beginning, it's it's not about your husband. It's for yourself. You're really submitting unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. You're submitting to God. And that's what really makes you beautiful. You have that ultimate hope because your hope is not in your husband. And so that allows all of us, brothers, we need to glean from this too, so that we don't come to the Zoom call with the Lord with this on. And we don't think that what we used to call this is acceptable. Like we have to come to the Lord and when we come to the Lord and God's word has worked on us, literally it's telling us that that is what God sees as beautiful. And so as, as the women of the past, as they adorned themselves in this way, they demonstrated their hope in God through this. This is how they demonstrated that they hoped in God because they would say, God, I can't control this. And I'm, I don't want to control this on my own hands. So I'm going to submit to my husband. But by doing so, I'm really surrendering everything to you. Yeah. And so their faith was a demonstration of their homegrown beauty. Because they were literally, they were hoping in God. And that hope in God looked like them saying, God, I'm either going to submit. God, I'm going to um, work on my gentle and quiet spirit. And that's what all of us have to get to the place that we do, that we're allowing God to work on us so that what looks like to the world, what it looks like to the world, what I hope looks like to the world as God is working on us is that we are trusting God with the outcomes and not just what we can do in our own hands. Yes, and that is the beauty of the word, that when it is in you, it will have it just a, comes out an, of outward, yes. an outward beauty. Again, back to my grandmother, she... She was, I think her inner beauty made her really more beautiful on the outside than she really was. You know, she was, she was described as, as a stately woman yeah. and um, she didn't have, uh, I think she may have had up to an elementary or middle school education, but she was the pillar of our family financially. I mean, like she accomplished a lot because of her, her rock, her foundation and hope and trust in God. Mm -hmm. And she, she would learn, she knew how to read, but she, she would learn scriptures, meditate, recite scriptures. I think I've told this story before that she is the reason that I know John Child. chapter one, yep. because I would spend time at her house in the summer, in the summers. Um, she, she lives in DC, lived in DC. Um, but I would spend time over her house in the summers and we pull out the Bible and we just start memorizing. It was fun for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't I didn't think of it as a tedious task. But now I can attribute that to my grandmother that I know John chapter one. Mm -hmm. And that that that's that means a lot to me. And that's that's beautiful. Uh, uh, another example that I have is right here within our own congregation. Um, Sister Dolores Morris, there have been so many, I can't even count how many times that after I've preached from a text of a passage of scripture, she'll come um, outside in the lobby greeting, greeting me, and she'll recite that whole passage of scripture back to me from memory. And if y'all know Sister Dolores Morris, she is a beautiful woman. And internally, it just exudes out of her. Mm. And it's because she has been meditating on God's word so much that she's able to recall it at just a drop of a hat. She's able to recite it back because she's been studying God's word. She's been memorizing God's word so that she can recall it. And I think that that is how her faith is demonstrated. It's as a result of her hoping in God by the, because of what she's able to recall. Yeah, you have to let it like. marinate. That's right. And that's what Sarah did mm. when she obeyed um, Abraham and called her her master. And and I think that, you know, it, it allows you to do what you probably were not comfortable of doing. I know, I think we talked about this, of how um, 
you know, how you talk to your man can influence how they live out. So if you talk to your man like he's nothing and he's just, uh, just, a, just a bama, then that's how he's going to act. But if you talk to him and you call, like she called him Lord, if you talk to him with respect and honor him and cherish him, he will begin to live up to the standard in the language that you have been talking to him in. Right. And that's what Sarah did. She didn't fear what was going to happen if she tried to do that and surrender to God. And she said, God, I'm going to trust you with all the outcomes and all the results. And that's what will bring, um, that's what will show that I really hope and trust in you. Yes, most amazing. I, but I also, <laughs> I also think that not only should wives and women look to the women of the past, but we also need to be looking to Jesus. Yes. Because after all, this <laughs> is where this passage begins instructing yes. us. It instructs us from, um, to, like Lady Key referred to earlier, in chapter 2, it says that in verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. We all should follow his steps. He committed no sin, no deceit within his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and now we can live, live for righteousness. And by his wounds we have been healed. For we were like sheep going astray, but now we have returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. And so we see what happened when Jesus submitted himself and when he suffered as a suffering servant. Literally, that's what that, that passage is referring to, Isaiah chapter 53, him being a suffering servant. But when he suffered and he submitted himself, he was able to win our freedom yes. from death yes. and to win us to be able to live now, truly live now. Right. So in closing, you want to? <clears throat> yes, I do. I want to. Um, I thought you were going to finish. In closing, we're going to, I'm going to recite the verses of the hymn, I Surrender All. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. That's the chorus. The next verse says, All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. And I'm going to read the next two verses because I have a, a great aunt that said all the verses are important. Yeah. Don't just skip over verse three like Baptists do. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me savior holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit. Truly know that thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. So thank you, Lady Key, for leading us in this. I hope that you all got the three points that she gave us. The first one is submission is a wife's women's demonstration of her homegrown beauty. But also action is a demonstration of homegrown beauty as well. Yes. And la lastly, faith is a demonstration of homegrown beauty as well. I hope that this has blessed you and encouraged our women because, listen, we thank God for our women in our churches because Amen. they have played such a vital and important role. And this is not trying to put women in their place by no means. But through this, we all can learn what will happen if we surrender to God and allow him to, um, to handle the results and the outcomes. And we just continue by faith to surrender to him. Can't wait for the husband's edition next week. Yes, we, yes, we are coming for you next week, husband. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for the joy of this moment. We pray, God, that your word would seek deep into our hearts and allow it to change us, allow it to bear good fruit, allow it to give us life, life so that we would then be able to give it to people all around us and even the un unbelieving world will see and know how good you are. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen.